Hey, Dave Deagle here. I just thought I'd take five minutes out of my day while I'm walking my son's dog to talk to you about our language patterns and how we can better manage that internal voice that's often so negative and makes life very difficult for us as performers. So I just had a phone call from a potential client who said to me, help, I think my internal voice is broken. It only plays on negative. So we spent a bit of time talking about the three different stages of our language pattern as an athlete. And I thought this is a great opportunity to, to share that with you and to show you how you can better manage that internal voice and to recognize it's not broken, it's just doing what it's supposed to do. So if we think about our internal and our external and our directive language, these are the three primary language patterns as an athlete that we use. And each of them have a very different use, different purpose and different process. And so I'll take you through each one of those right now and help you better understand and better manage each one of those. So the first one is our internal language. And I'll often say to me, my athletes, what's the purpose of our internal voice? Now we're always led to believe that we've got this this good version of our voice on one shoulder and this naughty version of our voice on another shoulder. You're not just gonna let him die like that, are you? My shoulder angel. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm gonna lead you down the path that rocks. I'll come off it. The reality is that's not how our brain works. It's nice in the movies, but it's not a reality. We don't have two different voices inside our head, one trying to convince the other one to be better behaved. That's not true at all. So the purpose of our internal voice is purely and simply to validate our emotions. So if we're feeling confident, if we're feeling positive about something, then that internal voice is designed specifically to look for reasons and validation for that feeling. More importantly, our internal voice, if we're feeling negative or fearful or scared of something, is to look for reasons for us to be fearful or scared. It wants to protect us and the way it protects us is backing itself. And it backs how we're feeling, even if that feeling doesn't have any validity. So if we're feeling scared and we're feeling nervous, then our brain's gonna turn around and go to our voice, okay, make sure that we don't do that. And so that internal voice is gonna turn around and say, yeah, absolutely, you should be scared there. Absolutely, there's something there to be fearful of. And we start to back away from that. It's like a very overcautious parent. And that's the whole idea of that internal voice is just purely and simply to validate that emotion. So when my potential client turned around and said to me, their internal voice was broken because it was only focused on the negative. What it was, was his data points were very much focused on the negative and the voice was just reflecting that. It wasn't causing that, it was just reflecting that. So that, if we think about our internal voice just being a validation for how we're feeling, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? The next circle is our external communication. So this is how we interact and communicate with other people. Peers around us, coaches, parents, anybody involved with what we're doing. And I'll often say to them, okay, so what's the purpose of that? The purpose of our external communication is information and collaboration. Now that information could be information that we're sharing, it could be information that we're requesting. And what we do with that information is collaborate with key people around us. So the purpose of that, that language pattern, purely and simply is, is either to share what we think we know, or to request better data from somebody who we think should know better. So we put that into our athlete's context. It's either telling a coach this is what I'm experiencing, this is what's going on, and what do you think, coach? Let's collaborate on that. Or it's, hey coach, I don't know what I'm doing here, can you help me out? I'm not sure what to think. 
about this skill, this process, this competition. So our external communication model is essentially just an information sharing and collaboration process. The third part of this is our directive language. Now what this is, is our actions taken. So this is what I'm going to do or this is what I need from you. It's the action aspect of our communication. It's that requesting for you to be doing something specific, either as an athlete and stating, hey, this is what I'm going to do, coach, please watch it for this reason. Or, hey, coach, can you go and do this and spot me here because I need your help. So that directive language is designed specifically to take action or outline action that's going to be taken. So we've got three different styles of communication here as an athlete that's really relevant. Our internal dialogue, which isn't the good and evil voice on one shoulder or the other shoulder. It is just validating how we feel. There's our external communication, which is information and collaboration and the design to either share or request information and to work through something together. And then we've got our directive language, which is really important when we're holding ourselves account to something or we want somebody else to be doing something. We've got to be really specific and targeted in requesting that from them. An interesting aspect to consider in today's communicative world is it's changed over, over time. And what we're starting to see with the digital age and the digital stimulation of athletes is their communication modeling is shifting. Now, when I was competing back in the 70s and 80s, I think my coach, Mitch Fenner, did an awesome job of communicating to different styles of athletes really well. However, I'm not sure how well he would have been able to communicate in today's environment. Because if we think about this from an evolution perspective, our first forms of communication were instant gratified driven. So that meant if we were hungry, we would go out and we would hunt down something and eat it. Or we would forage for something and eat it. Didn't matter whether it was morning, lunch, nighttime. If we were hungry, we fed ourselves. If we were tired, we would go and find a tree to sleep under. And again, wouldn't matter if it was in the morning, in the afternoon, or whatever time. So that instant gratification, that instant feeding of whatever we were feeling was part and parcel of our survival mechanism back in those days. And the same with stimulation. So if we needed to be stimulated, we got stimulated. Then came the Industrial Revolution and the whole concept of delayed gratification became really important to us. No longer, if we were hungry, did we just go and feed ourselves. We had to earn the money. We had to earn the, the trading component to that to then go and buy the food. If we wanted shelter, we didn't just go and sit under a tree. We, go, we went and worked for it. Then after a period of time, we got paid and we could pay for shelter and accommodation. So we became very delayed gratified. Had to follow a process, had to do things in order to get the outcome that we wanted. And this fed really well into high performance sport, where it's important for us to be able to follow a process to get an outcome, to be patient, to see that we've got to invest time, effort and practice to get an outcome. In today's society with the digital age and all these digital stimulants, we've become very instant gratified again. Not Maybe not back to the caveman days, but pretty close. And with that, some of the patience and process and understanding of following process by the athletes is, is being challenged. And because of this, our communication is being challenged too. We're wanting that instant stimulation much quicker. We're wanting that result much quicker. And we're less likely to follow a process 
we're less likely to collaborate. We're more likely to be self-stimulated. And because of this, our emotions have shifted a little bit, which means our internal dialogues aren't as necessarily process orientated as they used to be. We're less, as I said, we're less likely to collaborate, so we're more likely to get impatient. Our internal language patterns, our internal voices, can sometimes give us a false reading, where we think that we aren't being successful, where we think that what we've tried to achieve has been flawed or fault in some way, all of a sudden we're looking for a new stimulant, we're looking for a new way, instead of working our way through that. That can stimulate our internal voice to be less than kind to us. We can think that we're unable, incapable of doing certain things, where in reality is we just got to be a little bit more patient. Now when I'm talking to the older athlete, I can talk about driving a vehicle that is manual or shift because a lot more of them understand how to drive a manual or a shift vehicle. Where well, you've got three pedals. You've got the accelerator or the gas. You've got the brake and you've got the clutch. And you need all three of those in order to be able to drive that vehicle in the most efficient and effective way. Smooth and get the most out of that car. And what I'll say to them then is, if you could only use one of those pedals, how efficient and effective would you be at driving that vehicle? So if you could only use the accelerator, you would probably bunny hop all the way down the street. It wouldn't be very smooth. If you could only use the clutch, you'd probably stall the vehicle because you couldn't get it out of first gear. If you're only using the brake, then you're not going anywhere anyway. So the importance of this is to recognize you need all three of those pedals in order for that vehicle to work efficiently, effectively, and smoothly. And it's the same with our communication too. So I hope that's helped you better understand the way that your internal voice, your communication style with others, and your directive language patterns work together. So I'm gonna head back now, walk my son's dog back home. And I want you to have a real think about your language, how well it's being used. Are you using all three of those pedals or do you favor one? And if you favor one, what's it doing to your self-belief and your ability to perform? Hope you found some information in there that helps you. And the next time I'll drop another, another little bit of information for you. Until then, train smart. My name's Dave Deagle.